Hello, a bit of a strange video this one. I think everybody knows that if you want to be a programmer at the top of your game, and a programmer that stays at the top of their game, then you need to practice, and practice frequently. But a question I'm often asked on the YouTube channel and on the Discord server is, how do I practice? What should I be doing? Well, my approach has always been to take inspiration from the things around you. For example, given the current circumstances I'm in and our local lockdown, I've been playing a lot of board games with my wife. And board games will make you think of one of two things, either sitting in a traffic jam on a long way in the heat uh, to a destination that isn't going to be that interesting, or you'll be looking at the algorithms and the designs within to, well, try and think about how you can exploit the standard library to improve your C++ programming. Of course, I fell into the latter group. Now, the game that caught my eye was Yahtzee. It's a five dice based game, and it goes by lots of different names in different territories. And I have this travel version, I also have this uh, board game version from, well, about 300 years ago by the looks of the box. But the thing that caught my eye about Yahtzee is it has a very simple and elegant rule set. Uh, something I haven't attempted to implement in code before. So this might have been quite an interesting thing for me to try, and whilst at the same time, I'll try and learn some new things about C++. As the name of this video implies, we're going to use five dice. And that's the nice thing about these games, is there's nothing else to it. See, there's literally no other parts other than the five dice. Well, that's not quite true. There is also a scorecard. And the objective of the game is to roll the five dice, classify the score, and then choose which particular scoring entry you want to tick off. It's very, very simple. It's almost entirely random. There's a little bit of strategy as to whether you should sacrifice some scores for others. But it's also quite addictive. Anyway, when I look at this, I see a set of problems to solve. One is, how do we represent the dice? How do we roll them properly? And then how do we implement the rules? Now, this video is a bit of a strange one because there really is no end result. It's simply a summary of an entertaining evening I spent with myself trying to learn these new techniques. And as you know, on this channel, when I like to experiment with new things, I use my OLC Pixel Game Engine header file to handle user input and visualization. The header file consists of a small example project, which you can copy and paste to get you started. Here it is. I've derived a class from the Pixel Game Engine called Five Dice, given it a name, and I'm going to override the user create and user update functions. User create is called at the start of your application and user update is called every frame of your application. In my main, I construct a pixel game engine, which is 640 pixels wide by 480 pixels tall. I see games that involve five dice, like Yahtzee, as giving us several learning and practice opportunities. Firstly, we're going to need to know how to draw a die. That's one of the little cubes with some spots on it. Secondly, I'm going to explore how to roll multiple dies, dice. Then I'm going to explore algorithms for checking against the scoring rules. And we'll talk about those in detail at the time, but they're things like full house or straight. One of the things I'd like you to keep in the back of your mind whilst this video is playing is that unusually, I'm not trying to show the best ways to do anything. Instead, I'm just exploring techniques, and hopefully I'm going to learn something in the process. I guess before anything else, we need to use a container to store the dice in. Now, I could use a standard array, since the whole application assumes only five dice, but I'm going to use the good old standard vector, and we're going to add five dice numbers to it. Very simply, I can use an initializer list, one, two, three, four, five, to populate my standard vector with five unsigned integer types, which are eight bits in size, and the values of which are one, two, three, four, and five. We can use this simple vector to start developing the dice drawing routine. Here is the prototype for that routine, draw die, and it takes a variety of arguments. The first is the position on the screen we expect the dice to be drawn. Second is the value shown on the face. Third is the size of the dice in screen pixels. In this case, it's a 64 by 64 pixel square. Then I specify the background color of the dice, the color of its face. And finally, I specify the color of the spots. These last three arguments are supplied with default values. Therefore, if we're happy with the defaults, we only need to call the draw die function with the first two arguments, the position on the screen, and the value of the face. 
every time the screen updates, i.e. we have a new frame, I'm going to clear that frame to dark green. It's kind of that casino green. And very crudely, I'm going to draw five dice, explicitly giving the locations on the screen that I want them to appear. You can see I'm just indexing into my standard vector, treating it like a regular array. We know that all of the dice are going to be represented as squares on the screen of a given size and colour, so I can fill in the face straight away using the fillVect function. Drawing the spots, on the other hand, is a little trickier, and is the perfect opportunity to start practicing a little bit of algorithm design. Conventionally, the spot patterns on a six-sided die are as follows. One, two, three, four, five, and six. We can observe that the face of the die is split into sections. There are three potential rows of spots, a top, a middle, and a bottom. There are also three potential columns, left, middle, and right. Therefore, for a given face value, let's say the number two, we can associate that with spots drawn at top left and bottom right. Perhaps the most obvious way of implementing this is to use a simple if statement. If the face value was equal to two, then we'll draw dies at the top left and bottom right locations. And we know that this will work. But is there an opportunity to use this structure to explore new ways or perhaps just different ways of doing things? What I do know first is that in order to draw anything at all, I need to know the positions of these spots relative to the size of the face. So let's take the column middle value. I take the size of the square specified for the face and I know that the middle is in the middle. I'll multiply it by 0.5. Likewise, I can do the same for the left and I can do the same for the right. And just as I have done for columns, I can also do for rows. The size of the spot also needs to scale with the size of the face. Well, since I already know the position of basically the top left spot on the face, I can take that information and use that to scale the spot size, ensuring that it doesn't collide with other spots. This is one of those values that may need a little bit of tweaking later on. I've gone ahead and implemented the if approach. I've not used if, I've used switch case, but the principle is exactly the same. And we can see that for each face value, we're drawing the spots specifically. Let's take a look. And that's very nice. Our green background, our five dice, and the values one, two, three, four, and five. We can mix this up a little bit by adding a six in here, and let's add a couple of threes in there, and try again. Very nice, one, six, three, three, five. Even though this works, and it's very simple, it's quite a chunk of code. Perhaps there are alternative methods that are worth exploring. It's easy when you start designing an algorithm to become fixated on a singular way of solving the problem. If you want to develop as a programmer, you must overcome this urge and really do try and explore every possible avenue that is available to you. We've looked at having been given a face value of two, which spots to draw. What if we flip the idea on its head? For example, we know that this top left spot is drawn when the value is two. It's also drawn when it's three and four and five and six. This middle spot is drawn when the face value is one, three, or five. So perhaps we could go through all of the possible spots and check whether the face value means they should be drawn or not. Here is the fill circle function that I use to draw the top left spot. It would be nice to just call this based on a certain condition. In a pseudocode-like way, what I'm looking for would be something like this. We can define a set of all of the face values that require this particular dot, the top left, to be drawn. Well, let's look at it from that perspective. The standard library does provide us with a set class, and the syntax is not unsurprisingly quite similar. Here is our set. We need to give it a type, and I want to call a method on that set to see if it does contain the face value. Well, I'm using C++17, and at the moment, that doesn't actually contain anything that will tell me if the face value exists within the set. The best I can do is I can count how many of the set elements are equal to the face value. This has changed in C++20. The downside to using the count method is it has to count every element in the set. 
but the more desirable contains method could return as soon as it finds the first set value that equals the face value. I've implemented the equivalent set tests for the whole left hand column. This is for the middle dot and this is for the whole right hand column. So let's take a look and see if it works. Well, it certainly draws the correct faces, 1, 6, 3, 3, 5. And even though it's syntactically elegant, it has required that we import another library. It does require that we're using a different class and functions upon it. Has we inadvertently introduced complexity? Well, quite possibly yes. But there's been a side effect of having done it this way. Once the numbers are laid out in front of us, we begin to see patterns. Most notably, there's a symmetry. Here we're looking in the set 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, as we are up here. Here we're looking for 4, 5, 6, as we are here. By exploring alternative ways to represent this algorithm, we've visualised how it can be structured. And once we've reached that visualisation, we can see an immediate optimization. Firstly, we can see we only draw the middle dot when the face value is odd. So let's look at it like this. If the least significant bit of the face value is set, then the value has to be odd. We'll draw the middle spot. In the situation where the face value is any value greater than 1, we're drawing the left top and the right bottom. Likewise, if the value is greater than 3, we're drawing the left bottom or the right top. And finally, for the one value that stands out on its own, if the face value is equal to 6, we're drawing the middle row for both the left and right columns. We've reduced the problem now to a rather succinct solution. We began with the code being represented in a rather brute force manner, but would definitely work. We took a quick detour into the standard library to explore using a container in an unusual way, which allowed us to visualize the structure of the data required by this algorithm and therefore re-implement it in an optimal form. Next, I want to look at how do we roll the dice. Well, we're drawing everything every frame, and that's fine. So I only want to change the value of the dice when I press the spacebar. I'll add in a little event handle here, but we're sensitive to the spacebar being released. And in this instance is where I will change the value of the dice inside the vector. Dice are supposed to be random. And I'm not going to go into all of the various standard random forms provided by the standard library. We've looked at that in previous videos. And for the purposes of what I need today, rand will be sufficient. In the most simple manner, I could simply call rand five times. And just as before, I could do that in an initializer list. Let's take a look. But each time I press space, we see that the numbers change. I like this approach because the code is in many ways self-describing. But since I'm trying to find new and interesting ways to me, of how to achieve these simple tasks. What are the alternatives? Well, I'm going to skip over the fact we could sit in a loop. That one, I hope, is obvious. And whenever I want to learn something new and interesting and implement something I haven't before, I always take a quick dive into the algorithms library provided by the standard. There's all sorts going on in this library, lots of interesting features, uh, most of which you'll never ever need. However, they are there and they're worth looking at and reading about. My vector has already been sized. It's got five elements in. Something that is often required in programming is to operate on all of those elements, and usually with the same function. One option to us is the standard transform function. The arguments to this function are a little strange. The first two describe two iterators in some container. Now don't forget that most of these algorithm functions can apply to any containers. We're using a vector, but we could equally use a list or an array. It uses these two arguments to determine the source of the transformation. The third argument is another iterator to some other container, or indeed the container we're operating on. In this case, it is the same one. It's just the beginning of it. The result of the transformation will be written in this location. The transformation itself is described as this little lambda function. I am given the source value, and I could use the source value as part of my transform function. So let's take a look. Well, that behaves just fine. And you'll notice because we're not reseeding the rand function that the dice values are the same. Transform allows you to exchange data between two different containers if you wanted to. We don't want to. We just basically want to generate a set of values into our container. Well, fortunately, the standard has us covered yet again. We can use the standard generate function. Functionally, this is very similar, but now it applies to a single container and we just tell it where to start and where to end. 
Once we've chosen our five random dice values, naturally when you're playing these games you tend to sort them because it makes it easier to reason about your next decision. So I'm just going to call the standard sort function on my v-rolled vector. And so now we can see our initial set vector, which isn't sorted. This was 1, 6, 3, 3, 5. We set these manually. And I'll roll the dice. Now we've got 5, 5, 6, 6, 6. That would be a full house. One of the advantages of not playing around with reseeding the random number generator is we can get familiar with the first sequences of the dice. 1, 1, 3, 5, 5. 2, 2, 4, 6, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 6. Almost a straight. Regardless, it looks like our generation and sorting of the dice is working just fine. Now it's time to score the dice. And depending on the flavour of the game, these rules can vary quite significantly. As far as I'm aware, I'm going with the standard Yahtzee rules. Though no doubt this is going to cause all sorts of inflammation in the comments below. The first half of the rules are the easiest ones to implement. Firstly, there's what is known as chance, and this is simply the value of all the dice. I'm going to create a variable, uh, end score, and what particular rule we've applied. In this case, it's all the dice, and we're going to accumulate, using the standard accumulate function, all of the values in our vector of rolled dice. Accumulate doesn't live in the algorithm library, it lives in the numeric library. And the numeric library is also really worth diving into. It contains not quite as many functions, but lots of interesting ways to make containers interact with each other. So this will immediately sum all of the face values and store that summation. The next six rules are all very similar. We want to look at how many dice have a particular value, and that's our score. So if I rolled three ones and I chose that score for this instance, I want to count how many elements of my dice vector are equal to 1, and then I'm going to multiply that by the face value to give me the total score. Counting 1s is really a last resort in this game. It's one of the lowest scores you can achieve. We do the same thing for all of the other face values. These are the simple rules to implement. Now we've got the slightly more complicated ones. So I'm going to define the score variables and just initialize them to 0. And now, so we can visualize the scores, after I've drawn the dice, I'm also going to draw the score values. Hopefully quite a lot of you are already starting to see optimization opportunities. But let's take a look. With our first unsorted roll, we've got 1, 6, 3, 3, 5. So we can see that the total 1s, well, was equal to 1. The total of the 3s, because there were two 3s here, is 6. And the total of all of the dice, for which we use standard accumulate, is 18. These remaining rules are no longer just numerical calculations. They involve the sequence and the ordering of the dice. For example, I know that here 55666 five, six, six is a full house because we've got two fives and three sixes. That's two of a kind and three of a kind all in one hand. Likewise, since we sort the dice values, we know that we'll always see two and then three or we'll see three and then two. It's beginning to look like we'll need some form of pattern matching. Now, I know a lot of you will be going, oh no, we're going to go into standard regex. Well, uh, no we're not. I don't like regular expressions because fundamentally I don't understand them. And by the time I've learned how to use the regular expressions, then, well, I've probably implemented the algorithm anyway. At least, that's what happened in this case. If you're familiar with regular expressions, there are lots of standard library components that allow you to work with regular expressions. But I think for this simplistic case, it's a bit overkill. Instead, I'm going to create our own little pattern matching parser. And I'm going to do it as a lambda function, just to be a bit different. And so here is a lambda function called pattern match. It's going to take in uh, the vector of dice. It's going to take in a string that describes the pattern that we're looking for. And it's going to return bool if the dice values match the pattern. And my patterns are going to look something like this. I'm going to use n to describe a value that is discovered at first and then repeated. So in this case, if the first die in the vector of all of the dice is equal to, say, 5, then all subsequent n's must also be equal to 5. That would give us a check for 5 of a kind. That's the best hand you can get in these games. We would call that a Yahtzee, and that scores highly. Next, we would have 4 of a kind. Now, don't forget, our dice rolled vector is sorted, and that would leave us then with 4 identical dice and then some dice we don't care about, 
or some die we don't care about, then four identical dice. So there are two states that represent four of a kind. The next rule, similarly, is three of a kind. Now the full house that we saw earlier does fall under three of a kind. The player would choose which is better for them in that round of the game, and that's where the strategy comes into these largely luck-based games. In this case, I can have three dice that are the same and two that I don't care about, and those three dice that are the same exist either at the start of the vector, in the middle of the vector, or at the end of the vector. Now here is one of our first deviations of the rules. What do we consider a small straight to be? Well, in our little parser, I'm considering a small straight to be one of these four combinations. Now, where I specify a number, that is what I expect the face value to be. Basically, I'm looking for four incrementing numeric values in a sequence. Now, these will be sorted, so the sequence side is handled for us. This leaves us with only four possible combinations. One, two, three, four, and something I don't care about. Or something I don't care about, and two, three, four, five. Or it could be two, three, four, five, and something I don't care about, and then something I don't care about, three, four, five, six. This is described more simply when we look at a large straight. There's only two possible winning hands for a large straight, and that is where the dice values are equal to one, two, three, four, and five, or two, three, four, five, and six. The one that's going to cause us the most problems is actually identifying the full house. Remember, this was three of a kind and two of a kind. And after the dice are sorted, the patterns will be three of the same, and then two that we don't care about, but we must also have three that we don't care about and two of the same. So for a full house, the expression that we're parsing and pattern matching against requires that we and two other expressions. And so here we've described a very simple pattern matching syntax, which we can use in our pattern match function. I'm going to start by assuming that the pattern match is going to be true, and therefore, as we're analysing the pattern matching, anything that sets this value to false, well, the pattern doesn't match. So naturally, our lambda function will return this match value. I also know that for these ends, I'm going to need to store the face value of a dice the first time it encounters an n in the pattern. Now I'm going to put some constants into our little algorithm here. You could go away and make these uh, vector size dependent, but I know that I'm always going to be working with five dice. So I'm going to create a normal for loop with an incrementing index that will go through all of the dice in the vector of dice supplied to the lambda function. And I'm going to use this index to also index into the pattern string that is supplied with this lambda function. So I know that the string could contain the character n. It could contain the character question mark. And if it's neither n nor question mark, then it's going to be a number specifically. When the pattern value is a question mark, we honestly don't care what the dice value is. Therefore, this state will always effectively return true for this character. Likewise, for face value, we know specifically what we're looking for. If we've specified a 5 in that location of this pattern string, then the dice value must also be a 5 at that location in the vector. The 5 in the pattern string is indeed a character, not a number. But we can easily work out its number by making an assumption, and maybe it's a dirty assumption, that the difference between the ASCII or character representation for the digit 5 to the equivalent formatting for digit 0 is going to be 5. So this is a very quick and dirty way of converting a single character to its numerical equivalent. And then we can compare this numeric value with the numeric value of the dice face at that location, and if that matches, then we keep our match value at true. The tricky one is n. I've initialized n to zero, and that's quite deliberate because there are no face values of the value zero. Therefore, if the pattern string contains an n at this location, the first time I encounter n, which I'll know because n is equal to zero, I set n equal to the face value of the dice in the corresponding location. This sets n to something which isn't zero. So then all subsequent n's that are encountered in the pattern must equal the original n value discovered. Now, this also makes a dirty assumption that we'll never have an n on its own as part of the pattern string. And that's that. We've created a quick pattern matching lambda function where the patterns contain three types of characters. We check, is the digit in the pattern string the same as the face value of the dice in the vector at the corresponding location? 
If the pattern string contains a question mark, then for that location we don't care what the dice value is. And if the pattern string contains an n, well the first time round we want to store that value of n because for subsequent n's then that value must be the same. There are quite a number of things wrong with this approach. Firstly, it works on a fixed size. Secondly, it makes some assumptions that our patterns are going to be correct. But given the limited scope of this problem that we're trying to solve, I think that's okay. The game rules also limit the scope somewhat too, because there isn't really any room for, well, any other form of rule. Potentially two of a kind could be added, but we can already see what the pattern for that would be. Now we can implement the scoring for the different rules. Five of a kind is an easy pattern to match. We pass in the vector of rolled dice, we pass in the pattern that we're trying to match. If this returns true, there is a match, therefore the score for that element is set manually, and it's 50. Four of a kind has two possible valid patterns, so we'll match against them individually and all the results. And here is where we can cause some problems again, because the scoring depends on the type of game that you're playing. So in some versions of five dice, the score would be the all dice equivalent score. In the version I play, it's a little different. If I rolled four fives and a six, then my score would be 20. I effectively count only the dice involved in this four of a kind. So I can use the standard count function as we did earlier, but this time the face value isn't specified. Fortunately, I can see because I visualized the data set to the problem that element two of my patterns is always going to be the same. So I can take that element to be the face value which is used in evaluating the four of a kind score. I face exactly the same concern with three of a kind. This time we've got the three different patterns to match against, but we can see that the middle dice is always going to reflect the face value of the set of dice that formed the three of a kind pattern. And when I play these games, then that's the score that we take. So I count how many dice match that pattern, in this case it's three, and I multiply that by the face value. I could of course simplify this even further, because I know that it's three of a kind, why do I need to count them in the first place? The same of course goes for four of a kind too. Yet again, by visually exploring the code, writing the code down and looking at the patterns and looking at how things interact, we're starting to see how to make the code more succinct. The straights have fixed scores. We just look for the patterns, if any of them apply, then we return the fixed score value. And recall that full house was actually the tricky one. It too also returns a fixed score value, so that bit's easy. But the condition is a bit more complicated. We require that two patterns are matched in order to validate that it is a full house. And if either of those two patterns are matched, then we can conclude it is a full house. So let's take a look. Our first manually set roll of the dice well, that yields nothing at all. But let's go on to this next one, which is more interesting because we know that it is a full house. So we can see that the full house score was 25. We know that we've also got three of a kind. We've got three sixes. So the score there is 18. We could take total fives, in which case the score is 10. Not much going on in that hand or that one. This one, we've got a small straight. We've got one, two, three, four. This dice at the end, if it was a five, would make it a large straight. Here we've got another small straight, three, four, five, and six. Ah, perfect. Here we've got both a small straight in terms of two, three, four, five, or three, four, five, and six, but together that forms a large straight, two, three, four, five, six. That'd be a good score. This time we've got four of a kind, four fives. That's actually very good because four fives would give us 20. If it was four ones, well, we might want to take some other scoring route. And that's where the strategy of these games comes in. I've now finished the logic of the program, but this video is about exploring just different ways of doing things. And typically, I don't like big blocks of code like this. Instead, one possible way could be to create a vector of pairs of strings and scores. In this instance, we store the rule type and the scoring value. Pair basically fastens together two other types. It just makes it convenient so we don't have to create a structure and we're initializing this vector with this initializer list format. And I like this initializer list format because it kind of makes me feel as if everything's happening in one line of code. I know that it isn't, but it gives me that warm fuzzy feeling inside. Naturally then, we could expand upon this to also implant the scores that we've just calculated. Now that we've got the dice rolls in a vector and we've got the rules and the scores in a vector, we can reduce all of this code too. 
we've got some magic constants in here to make things appear on the screen in the right place. I'm going to start by storing those magic constants in this V offset 2D vector. And then I'm going to have a for loop which goes through and draws all of the die by setting the appropriate offset and specifying the die vector face value. I can also do the same for the scores now. I can iterate through my vectors of scores using this little auto for loop. Now the score type returned here is a pair. So again, using my offsets to position the rule on the screen in the appropriate location, I can take the first element of the pair, which is the name of the rule, the string, and then I can take the second element of the pair, which was the value of the score. I'll need to convert that to string in order to display it with the draw string function. And that's it. We're going to loop and draw all of our dice, and we're going to loop and draw all of our scoring rules. Let's just double check that that's working fine. Looks good. I really do like this initializer list format. It makes me wonder why do we even bother with this intermediate stage of storing the count values. We could just calculate the scores directly as part of this initialization list. Using standard count and standard accumulate, there are easy ones out the way. The rules that involve patterns, well, it's just the same thing, but it's a little unwieldy, I think. Here, I can call my pattern match lambda function, passing in the vector, passing in the pattern, knowing that it's going to return a Boolean value, using that as part of this ternary operator expression to decide on whether the score should be 50 or 0 for 5 of a kind. And I can go ahead and implement that for all of these rules. The lines get a bit long, and also potentially get a bit unreadable. One of the reasons for the verbosity in this instance is we're always passing in this v-rolled vector. Well, we know that that's always going to be the case. And we're calling the function for every different type of pattern for five dice. I'm going to create a duplicate of our pattern match function so we can make some changes to it. To keep the verbosity down, I'm just going to change its name to match. And I know that I'm always going to be working with the class member variable v-rolled. It's our vector of dice. So I'm going to allow it access to that too. Now instead of passing in the dice and a single pattern, I want to pass in a vector of patterns. We'll call that v patterns. The lambda function is effectively going to call our original lambda function multiple times. I'll need an overall result. And now it's simply a case of iterating through all of the patterns in the vector of patterns, oring together the individual results, which is what we were doing manually with the if statements, return the final result, and now the lambda function has direct access to the rolled vector we were using in the first place. I think now we've managed to reduce the verbosity of the code, and in a way increased its density, but I don't believe we've done that in a negative way. It's now quite easy to see straight away that three of a kind employs this particular rule set. You can see now we're just constructing or using the initializer list approach again to create a vector of strings. And if the result of the pattern match is true, then we're choosing the score appropriately. And if we bring in a compressed form of handling the spacebar, where we generate our dice rolls and sort them, excluding the drawing the dice and the pattern matching routine, our entire program fits on one screen, and I quite like stuff like that. So let's just make sure it works before we end. Well, I think that looks quite nice. Uh, I've learned a few new things today, particularly about the numerics library. I've learned about the generate and transform functions. I also had to learn how to pass in a class member variable as a lambda function capture. One of the reasons I've got a YouTube channel full of videos about a whole random assortment of topics is because I like to do this approach when I'm learning new things. It's a win-win situation. If I'm interested in learning about a new topic, for example in this case it was the rule sets of this dice game, then I can simultaneously learn about programming too. And there you have it, a quick look at how we can use everyday things to inspire us and give us interesting ideas for things to practice our code with. The nice thing about projects like this is it doesn't take more than a couple of hours to implement. And there are a variety of valid solutions, it's all about the journey rather than the end result. Now I know there is one more question that you'd all like to ask and the answer is any day now. But my wife and I would very much like to show our appreciation for all of the wonderful comments left on the previous video. We are working our way through them, we're trying to read and respond to every single one of them. So yes, definitely a strange one, but if you've enjoyed it, a big thumbs up please. Have a think about subscribing, certainly now the videos are not on a regular schedule, so that little subscription bell uh, could be quite useful. Come and have a chat on our Discord server, there's quite a lot of people on there all wanting to talk about code and how to get better at code, and they talk about, well, all sorts of rubbish as well. And I'll see you next time. Take care.